the annual Cabarrus Emergency Medical Services Radiological Emergency Preparedness Program training for a McGuire Nuclear Station response will be presented in a virtual format. In advance, thank you for your willingness to be part of this program. The agenda items will cover reception center activities associated with a response to a McGuire Nuclear Station incident, along with general radiological awareness. At an alert declaration, the EOC EMS lead may respond to the Emergency Operations Center as your contact position if conditions warrant. If two barriers are lost, a site area emergency will be declared. Equipment and item retrieval and delivery and school setup will occur at this level. If all barriers are lost, radioactive materials are possibly being released to the environment. Reception center operations will be available to perform monitoring and decontamination activities on evacuees, along with treatment and transport of contaminated and injured evacuees or emergency workers. Radiation is an ever-present part of our environment. Radiation comes from various sources that are listed. There are many ways an atom can pick up energy. In nature, this is not the most desirable condition. The atom will want to shed this energy to become stable. In doing this, the atom puts off radiation. There are three types of radiation you may encounter while performing your tasks, the alpha, beta, and gamma wave. This nuclear or ionizing radiation can penetrate our bodies, so we must be aware of how much is around us. REM is the term used to describe the amount of radiation you have received that addresses the biological effect produced on the human tissue. For this program, usually a word or the letter R also designates the equivalency of exposure since we are directly concerned with beta and gamma exposure only. The metric system is used to address a large or small amount of radiation. One rem equals 1000 millirem. Typical sources of radiation are found in nature and man-made. This listing compares these sources to total exposure you would receive. So how do we protect you so you can protect others? Annual or just-in-time training are key components. Guidance documents are available for use. They may include standard operating guidelines, positional checklist, forms and documents for data collection and tracking, and facility layouts. Personal dosimetry is provided that will allow you to track your exposure to radiation while you are responding to the event. Potassium iodide is available to protect your thyroid gland. Emergency worker dose limits are established to ensure you do not exceed the recommended limits of exposure during the event. Since you can't see, touch, taste, or smell radiation, how do we manage your exposure? Two types of dosimeter will be provided to you for any type of response. Both will measure your exposure for the entire event. The direct reading dosimeter is used to measure your exposure while you are performing your actions. This device can be read directly. It has two labels. The middle label shows the range and unique serial number. The other label informs the user of the calibration due date. The permanent record dosimeter is used to measure your exposure for the whole event. This device has the required information needed for documentation on the front of the dosimeter. Below the red county name is the two or three digit unique serial number. These badges do not have a calibration, but are changed out annually by emergency management. This is the view you will see looking through the eyepiece into a light source for the direct reading dosimeter. The scale is from zero to 20 rem. To track your radiation exposure while you are performing your activity, Hold this dosimeter up to a light source and read where the line crosses the 0 to 20 rem scale. This is your exposure. Prior to use, the dosimeter is re-zeroed to ensure there is available space on the dosimeter to receive the exposure allowed by the program. The trigger charger is the device used. 
This checklist is available to reserve the direct reading dosimeter. It can be found in the Radiological Information and Control, SOG. Follow the above steps to reserve your dosimeter for use. This video demonstrates the use of the trigger charger. To zero your direct reading dosimeter, place the DRD into the charger by squeezing the charger's trigger and inserting the bottom of the DRD into the metal contacts of the charger. With the trigger still squeezed, lift up on the clamp and push it in so that it sits tight against the dosimeter. Then release the trigger. Point the dosimeter towards a strong source of light and hold the clip end up to your eye to read where the line is on the scale. If the line is not on zero, squeeze the lever as many times as necessary to move the line back towards zero. If there is no line present when viewing, it means that the line is off scale. By squeezing the lever several times, the line will again appear on the scale where it can be set to zero. If the line on the scale is below zero, press the small black DC button and the line will move back towards zero. Once the dosimeter has been zeroed, squeeze the trigger to release it. Be sure to recheck the dosimeter immediately after it has been removed from the charger to ensure the line has not moved. This slide shows the scale of the 0 to 20 rem dosimeter and trigger numbers used to ensure you maintain your exposure as low as reasonably achievable. If the thin fiber line falls on the first line, this is your 1 rem administrative or call-in limit. Call your supervisor, inform them you have reached this exposure level, but continue to work. The supervisor will attempt to replace you if there is a person available. If the thin fiber line falls on the 5 rem area, this is your state turnback value. You do not want to receive the above this amount unless you have special permission. The Ultraradiac is an electronic dosimeter that can be used instead of the direct reading dosimeter. You still are required to have a permanent record dosimeter. The checklist provided will direct the setup and operation of this dosimeter. For setup of the Ultraradiac, perform the following actions. Remove the dosimeter from the case. Ensure the calibration date is current. Turn the ringlet one quarter turn counterclockwise and lift the battery compartment cover. Install four AAA batteries following the polarity markings on the top of the compartment. Close the cover and turn the ringlet one quarter turn clockwise. Install the Ultra Radiac back in the case. Turn on the meter by pressing the on off button. Allow the dosimeter to stabilize. If a low battery indicator is displayed, replace the batteries before use. To re-zero the dosimeter, press both the dose and clear test buttons together for a few seconds. The display will flash and then zero will be displayed. There are two modes of operation with this dosimeter. The default mode is rate. The rate mode informs the user on how much radiation is around them per an hour of time. If you spend 30 minutes in a 10 millirem per hour field of radiation, you would receive about 5 millirem of exposure. The dose mode allows you to track your exposure while performing your activity in the field, just like the direct reading dosimeter. This is the mode used most often for the McGuire nuclear station response. The dosimeter uses two alarms for each mode to keep the user informed. The rate alarm allows you to stay informed of the radiation field around you as you perform your actions. If the action allows, you always want to be in the lowest exposure area and still perform your actions. The rate will allow you to determine this and keep your exposure as low as possible. The dose alarms are used to overall exposure monitoring during your work activities where radiation is present. The dose alarms will ensure you do not exceed the state turnback value and informs you when you reach the administrative or call-in value. The rate alarm has a low rate alarm setting. If the dosimeter reaches this value, the unit will alarm with a vibration, visual, and audible. 
To reset the audible and vibration alert, press the clear test button. The visual will remain lit until you are below the alarm setting. If the low rate alarm occurs, move away from the source causing the alarm, if possible, and continue to work. The rate alarm has a high rate alarm setting. If the dosimeter reaches this value, the unit will alarm with a vibration, visual, and audible. To reset the vibration alert, press the clear test button. The visual and audible alerts will remain until you are below the alarm setting. If the high rate alarm occurs, move away from the source causing the alarm if possible and continue to work. Increase your dose readings. The dose alarm has a low dose alarm setting. If the dosimeter reaches this value, the unit will alarm with a vibration, visual, and audible. To reset the audible and vibration alert, press the clear test button. The visual will remain lit until the dose is reset to zero. If the low dose alarm occurs, move away from the source causing the alarm, if possible, and continue to work. The dose alarm has a high dose alarm setting. If the dosimeter reaches this value, the unit will alarm with a vibration, visual, and audible. To reset the vibration alert, press the clear test button. The visual and audible alerts will remain until you reset the dose to zero. If the high dose alarm occurs, Exit the area and inform your group leader. Read your dosimeter. State times are used to provide another tool for the user to ensure you do not reach your dose limits. Press the alarm button to determine how many minutes you have in the area before you reach your dose setting. If you are working in a low light condition, press the light button. This light will remain lit for approximately five seconds. Battery strength is very important for proper operation of the dosimeter. If you see a blinking 8 displayed, the dosimeter has malfunction. Replace the batteries. If you see a blinking bat displayed, the dosimeter has less than 10 hours of operation. Replace the batteries as soon as possible. If you see a blank display, the batteries are dead. Replace the batteries. This personal radiation exposure record card is used to document all radiological items given to you for your response. This includes direct reading or ultra radiac dosimeter, permanent record dosimeter, and potassium iodide tablets. This card has reminders of your exposure limits and use of potassium iodide. If you are dressed out in protective clothing, this card remains with your group leader in a clean area. You will be asked to read your direct reading or ultra radiac dosimeter every 15 to 30 minutes to verify your exposure. If group dosimetry is being used in your area, your periodic reading will be read and communicated to you by a designated position. This is a continuation of information documented on the personal radiation exposure record card. Potassium iodide, or KI, is used to block the uptake of radioactive iodine to the thyroid gland. If ingested early in the release of the radioactive iodine, the dose to the thyroid gland will be reduced, thus reducing the chance of thyroid cancer later on in life. Each adult would take two tablets a day for 10 days or as directed by the state or county health director. You must have permission to take KI. Although KI is an over-the-counter drug, one must be aware of the side effects. Never take potassium iodide if you have a known allergy to iodide. KI administration is voluntary. You are not required to take the drug if requested. Possible side effects to the ingestion of KI is a mild rash or a metallic taste in the back of your throat. Radioactive materials that emit radiation are said to be radioactive. Radioactive material in an unwanted area is called contamination. Remember, contamination acts just like wet paint on hands. It is easily transferred to another surface. There are two ways we use to find contamination. The Ludlam Model 26 handheld survey meter and the Ludlam Model 52.1 or 52.1.1 portal monitor. The Ludlam Model 26 handheld contamination survey meter is used to detect contamination on small surface areas. Use this checklist to prepare the meter for use. 
The following video will show the setup of the meter. Be aware that only the first mode of operation is used. Remember not to press the red button while the meter is turned on. Check the calibration label to ensure the meter is still within calibration. Open the handle of the meter and insert two AA batteries. The meter will automatically power up. Replace the cover and remove the plastic cap covering the back of the meter. If needed or desired, you can mute the volume at any time by pressing the green button. To restore the sound, press the green button again. Locate the calibration label on the side and identify the range of reading. The Ludlum 26 has three modes. Normal mode, which is the default mode for measuring the current count rate. Max mode, which displays the peak level recorded since the meter was turned on. And the count mode, which uses a one minute timer to determine the exact counts in a one minute period of time. Ensure the Ludlum 26 is in the normal mode for the pre-deployment operational check. Confirm that the check source is the correct one for that meter. Then hold the Ludlum 26 against the check source and watch the count rise. Once the rate levels off, compare the reading against the calibration label if it falls within the range. Cover the end of the meter with a plastic bag and secure it with a rubber band. If the meter reaches 300 counts per minute, the area being surveyed is considered contaminated. This area must be decontaminated per protocols and procedures. The meter will automatically alarm if this trigger number is reached. With the meter about one inch away from the person or object, move the meter at a speed of one to two inches per second, covering the entire area. Use the low and slow method of monitoring. During this monitoring phase, if you are distracted and actually touch the person or object with the probe, pull the probe away from the object and observe the reading. If the reading is similar to the background reading you perform during setup, continue with the monitoring. If the reading is elevated, stop, change out the plastic cover with new, and continue with the monitoring. If it takes four to five minutes to survey an average sized person, how do we proceed with monitoring possibly hundreds of evacuees at a reception center? The reception center is equipped with multiple portal monitors. Use the setup and operational checklist to prepare the portal monitor for use in the field. This is the checklist used to set up the monitor. This is the checklist used for the response check of the portal monitor. The video you are about to see demonstrates these operational source checks using the walkthrough method of monitoring. With the changes in the new layout using the auxiliary gym, the portal monitors have been set up for a two second count time. When the video shows the person placing their hand over the infrared beam to start the monitoring, you will need to keep your hand blocking the beam and the source near the detector or midline checks for the two second count time until the monitor alarms. 2-1 portal monitor to screen evacuees from York County at each one of our reception centers. This video will cover how to assemble the portal monitor and conduct an operational check. The portal monitor comes in a container that can be used for shipping and storage. Unpack the container and inventory items to ensure that all pieces are present. The container is equipped with one base section, one bottom left section labeled L1, one top left section labeled L3, one bottom right section labeled R1, one top right section labeled R3, one top section, one electronic section, three D-cell batteries, one radioactive check source.
The portal monitor can be assembled without tools, but the use of a quarter can be helpful when installing the batteries. All connections are made with latches. To connect the latch, lift up the bottom tab. Hook the top crossbar into the hook on the piece that you are attaching and push the tab back down until it snaps into place. Set the base on the ground with the rectangular tubes pointing up. Insert the male end of the bottom right section into the female side bracket of the base marked R1 and attach the latches. The detector screens must be facing the middle of the portal. Insert the male end of the top right section into the female end of the bottom right section and attach the latches. Repeat the process for the left side. Insert the top into the tops of the side section and attach the latches. Ensure that the panels are assembled with all red labels on one side and all green labels on the opposite side. Labels are numbered and color coded to assist with correct assembly. Install three D cell batteries into the battery compartment. Plug the connector end of the electronics section onto the back of the bottom left section with the battery compartment end facing down. First, engage the black connectors. Then ensure that the pin on the back of the bottom left section goes into the hole on the electronics section. Attach the latches. Turn on the power switch located on the bottom of the electronics section and allow the instrument to finish updating. To ensure that the instrument is functioning correctly, an operational check should be performed before using the instrument. This check verifies that the instrument is turned on, that the settings are appropriate, and that the system alarms when the detectors are exposed to excess radiation above background level. Operational checks should be performed after setup and before use. As long as the system passes the operational check, no calibration or other checks are necessary. Check each of the detectors for sensitivity to beta and gamma radiation using the radioactive source provided. A check must be conducted on each panel section. Activate the check process by breaking the cross beam with your opposite hand and holding the check source hand toward the panel section being tested. Keep the source in place until the alarm sounds. The lights on the electronic section should also come on. Repeat the alarm checks for each panel section. To also provide assurance that the instrument meets the FEMA emergency response criteria prior to the operation of this portal, do the following. Pass the check source through the center of the portal at several points between 0.5 and 5.5 feet from the floor of the portal and verify that the alarm is triggered each time. Hold the check source between your thumb and forefinger when conducting the center line check. This will expose the check source to both sides of the portal monitor. Allow the electronic section alarm to reset before checking the next center line position. A successful centerline check will activate either both left and right top or both left and right bottom panel section alarms at the same time. Once the portal monitor has been verified operational, complete the label located on the portal monitor leg. Perform the check at least each shift or as directed. Use press and seal, cling wrap, or other type of plastic wraps to cover the detector areas of the monitor. 
Run the plastic from top of the detectors towards the pedestal. Wrap the plastic around the back side of the leg sections. When covering the pedestal, ensure it is easily removed if needed. You can use a type of plastic, monitoring sticky pad, butcher paper, or equivalent. Portal monitors are used as a go-no-go -go process for identifying contamination. If the evacuee does not alarm the monitor, the person steps through to the clean side. If the evacuee alarms the monitor, the person steps back out of the monitor and is directed to further monitoring and decontamination. So what are we asking you to do for a response to a nuclear event? A reception center is established to receive the public that has been asked to evacuate their homes and businesses due to an imminent or actual radiological release from the nuclear site. The reception center is set up to monitor and, if needed, decontaminate the evacuee. The remaining slides provide an overview of setup and basic operation of the reception center. Be aware that a setup and walkthrough of the facility at the location is vital in maintaining proficiency of operation. Cabera CMS has been asked to assist in the female locker room area for decontamination and provide transport for evacuees or emergency workers that require transport to a hospital due to being contaminated and injured. The latest revision of the procedures aligns processes and steps that mostly come from using the auxiliary gym for portal monitor operations. For those that have been through this training and have demonstrated for FEMA, you will see flow path changes, the use of positional job action sheets, and forms used to document certain aspects of the process. Once the schools are open to outside agencies, a scheduled walkthrough training session will be provided to give a visual of these changes. This slide provides a list of which agency is doing what function. Kannapolis Fire Department has the lead in monitoring and decontamination of the public as they arrive at the reception center. This slide shows the four areas of operation. The outside operation of the portal monitors has been moved inside into the auxiliary gym. If you have any needs or concerns, contact your group leader or the radiological officer for resolution. This slide addresses communication used throughout the reception center and congregate care facility. If you are dressed out to work in a contaminated area, place your radio in a bag and key through as needed. This dress out is used when you need to enter a contaminated area but are not performing any work activities. An example may be a group leader entering the area to brief the positions on changing conditions. Observe the list of cautions for this dress out. This is the standardized dress out for all other workers. Read this checklist line by line as the responders are dressing out to ensure compliance with the order of dress attire. These are the items for personal protective clothing used for a nuclear event response. Standardized dress includes Tyvek suit with hood, calf height shoe covers, ankle height shoe covers, two pair of surgeon gloves, and the use of masking tape or equivalent to seal the sections. Do not use duct tape if at all possible. This is just an overhead view of the transfer area from the football field to the auxiliary gym, showing animal drop-off, incident command post, ambulance staging area, and the male-female locker room areas. The magenta color shows the pathway for potentially contaminated individuals. The evacuee now moves to the male or female decontamination area for final processing. Both are identical in setup and operation, so we will address the male side for this training only. There are two large layout drawings available for this area. One provides direction on how to set up the area, and the other provides pathways and detailed instructions on how to operate the same area. These are the positions that, if resources permit, will be used to process evacuees through decontamination. The decon method controller position is the first person to greet the evacuee in this area. They request the evacuee to open the two-gallon Ziploc bag and you remove the completed survey form. Remember, this form was repaired by the technical recorder who was operating in a clean area, so the form should also be clean. 
This position determines the best decontamination method for the individual based on the contamination location and amount. The job action sheet will lead this person through the decision making process. This position operates in a clean area and does not require protective clothing except surgeon's gloves if situation warrants. This position uses and manages the group dosimetry for exposure updates. This is the evacuee contamination record form that was brought to your area in the two gallon Ziploc bag. The first column shows where the portal monitor found contamination. The second column shows the detail of contamination amount and location using the handheld survey meter. The third column is used to document the post decontamination survey method and its effectiveness. Eventually, the portal monitor will be used for the release of the individual. When determining the best decontamination method, the above provides guidance. Your options are spot decontamination first. This could include the removal of clothing or the use of a sink or baby wipes. The last option is a full shower. The technical recorder position updates all the documentation used in this area. Once the evacuee has been verified clean by the portal monitor, a green wristband is provided to the individual. This position also provides a receipt document for clothing and valuables that were removed during the decontamination process. For this operation, clothing will not be returned to the evacuee due to constraints with resources and equipment needs. This position operates in the clean area and does not require protective clothing except surgeon's gloves if situations warrant. This position uses group dosimetry for exposure updates. This is the receipt provided to the evacuee. Every effort will be made to return the valuables to the individual in a timely fashion. A processing area and position is used to manage this portion of the response. The valuables processor position is dedicated to the processing of valuables. Use the table provided and decontamination techniques available to manage this portion of the response. This position is dressed out in protective clothing and will use group dosimetry for exposure updates. The spot decomposition will manage the spot decontamination techniques as provided by the decon method controller position. As a reminder, the techniques available in this area are baby wipes and soap water on intact skin for small areas of contamination, along with removal of a piece or pieces of clothing. After decontamination efforts, this position will perform a spot contamination survey on the areas that were once contaminated. If clean, move the individual through the portal monitor for final contamination verification. This position is dressed out in protective clothing and will use group dosimetry for exposure updates. The full shower position manages the full shower decontamination technique. This method also requires the removal of all clothing and valuables. Work closely with the technical recorder to document items removed from the individual. After decontamination efforts, this position will perform a spot contamination survey on the areas of contamination. If clean, move the individual through the portal monitor for final contamination verification. This position is dressed out in protective clothing and will be using group dosimetry for exposure updates. Throughout all the processing areas, contamination control is the key to managing the facility. Various techniques can be used to remove contamination from surface areas or items. The above picture shows various items that can be used for contamination removal. Remember, contamination acts like mud or dust. If it is dry in the area of contamination, use the Maslin cloth Swiffer mop combination to clean the areas. If it is wet conditions, use soap, water, and a mop to clean those areas. For large areas of wet contamination, a squeegee can be used to push the water towards a floor drain. On a small article, use a piece of Maslin cloth or wet rag. For spot decontamination techniques used on evacuees or emergency workers, baby wipes, soap and water, or removal of clothing will be adequate to remove the contamination. On a side note, if contamination is located on an area of the body that is beyond the capabilities of the facility, transport will occur to send the individual to a certified hospital for technical decontamination. A full shower will use soap and water. Ensure you dab dry the individual after a shower 
to ensure you do not push contamination into the skin. We will now transition to the processing of a contaminated and injured patient. The above list outlines the activities required to prepare the facility and EMS response at the reception center. The dark blue lettering action is prepared by EMS. The black lettering is a joint preparation with the fire department and other responding agencies. Preparing the backboard for use will be required prior to the response. Perform the following actions. Lay a sheet or blanket open on the ground. Lay another sheet or blanket on top of the first. Place the backboard on top of the sheet's blankets. Roll each side of the sheet's blankets to the top of the backboard. Place your medical bag on the backboard. You are now ready to respond for patient retrieval. Preparing the gurney for patient movement at the scene should occur early in the setup portion of the reception center. Open a gurney, place a blanket or sheet over the gurney, and stage the prepared gurney near the ambulance. The two approved hospitals in the area for patient transport are Atrium Health University as the primary facility, along with Atrium Health's Carolina Medical Center as a backup or receipt of a trauma patient. This checklist provides guidance on how to prepare the ambulance to receive a contaminated and injured patient. The goal is to put away all items not required for the transport and retrieve all items you may need for the transport. The cocoon of the patient inside two barriers will prevent the ambulance from cross-contamination. Place a bag in the area for radioactive waste. Stage a survey meter in the ambulance within reach. The contamination survey meter has already had set up and operations checks performed prior to the facility activation by the fire department. Dress out in appropriate PPE using this checklist. If you have a life-threatening situation, you can respond to the area with your uniform and dosimetry only. For life-threatening response, the goal is to stabilize and transfer the victim to the hospital. Upon arrival to the victim, open the two sheets. Place the medical bag on the top sheet. Triage and perform life-saving activities. Stabilize the victim medically. Move victim to the backboard using normal protocols. Move the victim backboard to the sheet. Wrap the top sheet over the patient and transfer to the prepared gurney. Cover the patient with the gurney sheet and load into ambulance. Transport to hospital. For non-life-threatening response, the goal is to stabilize, perform gross decontamination, cover the wound, and transfer the victim to the hospital. Upon arrival to the victim, open the two sheets, place the medical bag on the top sheet, triage the patient, and stabilize as needed. Remove all clothing by cutting up the legs and arms down from the shirt and laying all clothing items open on the ground. Cover open wounds if needed. Move patient to backboard using normal protocols, leaving the cut clothing on the ground. Move the victim backboard to the sheet, wrap the top sheet over the patient, and transfer to the prepared gurney. Cover the victim with the gurney sheet and load into ambulance. Transport to hospital. This concludes the annual virtual training. For questions or concerns, please contact Cabarrus County Emergency Management. The 2021 exercise has been scheduled for August 3rd. The week of July 19th has been scheduled for all out-of-sequence activities requiring FEMA evaluation. Reception center activities will be evaluated sometime during this week. Not only for your willingness to respond to a rep event, but for your continued service to the community, thank you. This concludes the annual Radiological Emergency Preparedness Program training for a McGuire Nuclear Station response. Please ensure you have placed your name on the roster.